Brian De Palma's The Untouchables, which, to borrow a term from the Countdown movie and TV reviews podcast, this was De Palma before he, quote, De palma if you will. Uh, this one actually was a first time watch for me uh, yesterday. I actually had never seen this film before yesterday. I just had the chance to check this out, but I want to get around the panel here. And I'll start with you, John. Uh, just opening um, thoughts on The Untouchables. Uh, opening thoughts. I, I really think this is a great film. Like, really, uh, I've watched it many times over the years, and I actually watched it not too long ago, actually getting ready for this, and I, I still enjoyed it. I think it was one of the better Kevin, Kevin Costner roles, and Sam, uh, and Sean Connery's character is freaking awesome. I love him from the moment you first meet him uh, when he's walking down the beat, and he's just, like, uh, giving Kevin Costner's character shit and then when he asked him a question he was like what am i supposed to do teach you how to be a cop you're supposed to learn that on day one so i mean and the way it all plays out with capone and de niro it's amazing i just uh, i love it i mean i i really enjoy it and i, I kind of want to move <laughs> uh, sorry running out of things to say for a second because i was like um overthinking myself but yeah no like the overthink the whole thing is though that uh andy garcia when you meet him is great and like the the moment the um account of fbi account i can't remember his actual name right this moment when he comes in he actually gets the shotgun he starts loving it and then he actually dies that's a hard that's, that's a hard moment because that's when like they find out they're completely touchable and the group kind of starts falling apart and uh, when the, the the whole story like gets to the end, I mean, there, there's a hell of an impact. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I, I I I absolutely agree. There was a there was a few scenes in this film, and I I definitely had some issues with it. And since I'm watching it, what thirty years removed now uh, from its original release, I, I probably have a little bit of a different opinion uh, uh, on it than most do, uh, especially when it comes to. De Niro as uh, Al Capone, but I'll swing over to you, JD, uh, to start on this one. Okay. Well, um, I am a, in a slightly different camp <laughs> there, and I hate to be the Debbie Downer of this particular discussion, but I, you know, I, here's the thing. I like The Untouchables. I think it's a fine movie. I don't think it's anything more than that. For me, The Untouchables suffers from um, – significant narrative issues uh especially the way it inter interweaves uh al capone i i feel like it doesn't for me it doesn't give uh, a glimmer of what makes the man tick or why he does what he does i feel like they're just kind of thrown in there randomly to kind of you know add stakes or add drama but it, it to me there isn't a rhythm to the film and part of that is is in the screenplay and i think part of that is also in uh, De Palma's direction, the editing and the pacing of the movie just doesn't make sense to me at all in, in certain parts. Um, I think the idea of this group coming together and to, you know, you know, stifle this rampant corruption in Chicago, the, the idea on paper is great. And I do like Costner. I think Sean Connery is actually really great in the film. Um, but it's hard for me to engage with the film dramatically because of those narrative and direction issues I've been talking about. So, um, it, you know, for me, it's it's a decent watch. It's one that I would still recommend, but it's nothing special to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to jump right off of that, J.D. When I watch the film, I think it's got some really great uh like set pieces it's got some really really great setups where you know you see like like the, mm. when sean connery's character is killed i really think that whole scene is fantastic i think that he kind of builds up the tension in that well uh but that's the problem this is this film's kind of all about the money shots for me outside of those really yeah. those scenes that really kind of you know you're like you're transfixed on the screen there's also those scenes, and I know I'm probably going to get shit for this, but I don't care. Like the final shootout in the like the train station or whatever it is with the baby carriage, like there's so many lingering fucking shots on that kid in the baby carriage. I wanted to scream. I'm like, Jesus, yeah. God damn it! Stop showing me the fucking kid. 
I don't care. But they wanted you to remember that baby was there. Oh my Never God. forget the baby. Jesus. Like, it just, it was egregiously, a like, people fucking bitch about Zack Snyder loving snow, slow-mo and shit. Oh, my God. It, it, like I said, it just, like, the egregious shot after shot after shot of the baby and the damn thing. It's like, okay, we get it. There's a baby. Oh, my God. But, like, uh, to go back to what I was going to say about De Niro. Yeah. I, I think he's fantastic as Al Capone for the minute and a half of screen time he actually gets in the film. He's barely in the fucking movie. Yeah. yeah. He's barely it, even yeah. fucking in it. Yeah. Oh, my it's, God. It's I was so frustrated. more than a minute. Well, it's a little more than a Okay, fine. I'm being a little bit, uh, you know. <laughs> who recommended dramatic, this film, by the way? Who I recommended know, this? I don't remember who recommended oh, it for Spotlight, film. but. Um, I think the entire I fucking thing did. Kind of like I fucking did. Like, I, I did. think the entire thing kind of relies <laughs> on everyone knowing the uh, general story of Al Capone yeah. already when you go into it. I think it, like that's the reason yeah. there's not a lot of like actual lingering setup with the characters, is they're already expecting you to know. Yeah. The general backstory and that's, that's of this character and everything, and I feel like that's a little bit of a cop out. It is, but uh, yeah, it's lazy. I mean, just yes. no. I guess knowing that, I didn't find a lot of fault with it when I re- originally watched it, and still kind of don't. But I mean, yeah, I mean, for the general audience viewer, that's probably not a great idea. <sighs> well, and, you and go the- into it and just because you have to have characters set up with people because i mean the, the general idea is that you don't actually need to rely on the fact that this person actually knows what the backstory yeah. is unless it's spider-man you know <laughs> and, then everyone knows the fucking <laughs> like, up, backstory up, and no up, one guys. needs to know hold up hold up hold up please please for a second nick please, forgot the please. epic film guys is plural please. for a second there who um, what Get out of here. <laughs> if you want to change Please, the name Justin. of the show, if you want to change the name of the show and do something else, that's totally cool with me hey, if you want you, to do that. But jump in here. Throw your voice otherwise, in here. Let us have it. What are you hiding pay for? Attention. Pay the fuck attention. Nobody Runs, pays uh, attention. This was the film. This is the Jumps film that on. I picked. This is the film that I picked back in like September for Spotlight. Yeah, Spotlight is a segment that we wanted to premiere months and months and months ago, but unfortunately we just never okay. got the time. That's why I decided I that, when we did the live stream I get the Knicks- to do it. Well, what happened? I'm I lost everybody. No, oh, I'm I'm oh. here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, you just fucking talk over me every single time. No, I, I talk, just so. it, it completely cut out. Everything yeah. cut out. Yeah, it was weird. All right, go ahead. No, is it go silent? Ahead. Is it silent? Am I going to be talked over? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I get that Nick had his bourbon. I get that Nick had his buffalo mac and cheese. Um, but this was a segment that I was looking forward I to. Need some more because it's one of the, It's one of the only segments that I had actually any input on because I picked this film many, 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 many months ago because of my avid love for it. I absolutely adore this film. Um, Brian De Palma's direction in the film is absolutely perfect for a gangster flick in the 80s. And it shows, if you watch the film, it is definitely an 80s-centric film. Yeah. Slash, I, yeah. Put that thing in your mouth, Nick. I'm going to punch it right down your <laughs> fucking throat. What a dick. I'm going to take that thing. I'm going to shove it so far down. You're going to be choking. And, and, and hearing Dan's voice makes me even more aggravated to want to punch it even further down. It does um, aggravate everybody. <laughs> It does. I, I love everybody, but um, I don't care about the faults of this movie. I don't give a shit. I grew up watching this movie, and I feel like it's the best depiction of Al Capone that's on the big screen that we've ever seen, only because of the simple fact that I feel like even though De Niro was not the one they wanted people, people didn't want De Niro cast. Um, he was the one that was like against the grain. Um, I feel like he did a fantastic job of portraying at least who the character was of of Al Capone as we knew him in the public eye of being that kind of like um, very lovable public persona, but in the back of the room kind of situation, very dark and violent person. Um, and we do get enough of him to get a, a fixture on that character. He's not supposed to be the main front of the film. It's called The Untouchables. And I love that there's that mystery of the Al Capone character in the film. And one of the standouts in this movie, outside of Sean Connery, is 
class, and this is one of his breakout performances. I absolutely love him. And 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 all out of all the '80s films that have come out, um, Brian De Palma had a certain sensibility that he took when he got behind the camera, and he took that kind of halfway sleaze that he has with him uh, in a lot of films that he did, even including Scarface when he made this movie. So I, I absolutely love it, and I love how brutal it is, and it's relentless and its action sequences. And you guys all mentioned that whole stair sequence with the baby and the slow-mo dude, nothing was done like that during that time. So you guys can mention Zack Snyder. You can mention all these modern homeboys making movies. Now, nothing had been done like that up until that True. point with that super, super slow-mo. It was super stylized for the time, but it took audiences by chance. And they were like, Whoa, we've never seen anything like this before. It's so silent. There's very little, there's no dialogue. There's just, an emotion to the situation and it's fantastic and I absolutely adore it. And that's why I love the untouchables. I think it's one of the best gangster flicks of the eighties because of the simple fact that Brian De Palma has a handle on the material. Is it an amazing film? No, I would have to take a step back and say, it's not one of his best, but it's still a great, well-directed film, especially for the gangster genre. I, I mean, I, I think that's very fair, Justin, and I respect what you're saying. And, and for me, it's less so much the execution of the style stylization in the film as much as the film overall is more uh, concerned with that style than it is substance. And and for me, which that was the wasn't, 80s, which was the 80s. I mean, it's yeah, the 80s, yeah. We, absolutely. And again, that that is certainly fair, but there's... There, there are even films in the 80s that I feel like were able to bring a balance of both. And while the film doesn't necessarily we have a finger on the Al Capone character, the, my, my big problem with the is, is that the, there are, when, when De Palma decides to bring Capone in, onto the screen – there he he feels like there has to be weight to it and it feels like the the film is concerned about it but only in those particular moments and the way he interweaves that throughout the film uh it just feels somewhat cheap in the long run and 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 i would have appreciated perhaps a little bit more insight into what made him tick even if we weren't gonna uh you don't necessarily have to expand on or give us exposition on the character let's, why he's like let's I, talk to let's talk about something that's great about this movie let's talk about something fantastic about this movie any of Mor morricone's score to the film what do you guys think about the score i like the score sure yeah the score is enjoyable oh, come on. you guys sound like so like it's not that great i mean seriously think about that score when this film opens that's an, an iconic score for this film we don't yeah. get scores like that anymore well, and, and, and Sean Connery yeah. won an Oscar for this film. Sean Connery won it's a true. Best Actor in a Very Supporting true. Role. I feel like it's one of the best performances of his career because he, he was an older guy when he made the movie. And he put so much effort into this performance. And it, it's such a great cast of the movie. I mean, yeah. dumbing down how great the film is outside of its narrative aspect. Um well, and like I said in my initial thoughts, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't go as far as to say the bill, the film is bad, and I wouldn't, I, and I, and I said I would recommend the movie. I just don't think it's anything truly special or anything truly great. It's, it's fun. It, it lives in its stylization. It and wheels the it on its sleeve. Fantastic, right? Yeah, the aesthetics are wonderful throughout the film. Absolutely, that, no doubt about that. But it's just Very a stifling thing. experience dramatically, and that's what keeps me from fully engaging with it. Well, right I mean, now, know. when is the first time you guys have both seen this film? Mm -hmm. Well, Nick, Nick said it was the first time he had seen it. Like I'm not asking Nick. I'm asking, oh, I'm, okay. I'm asking our guests. <laughs> you guys. I, yeah, guys. Um, uh, I've seen it. Like I saw it years ago. I mean, I saw it back. Probably when I was about 10 years old was the first time I actually saw the movie. Yeah, I had seen it a while ago as well. It was one, it was a film that my dad really liked. So I, I definitely saw it when I was a kid. Um, and I did rewatch it um, sorry, sorry. in preparation for this. 
Yeah, I did too. But uh, there was actually something I wanted to comment about JD when he was saying uh, with the storyline and kind of wanting a little bit more about uh, Capone and the way he ticks. I mean, I don't know if that's essential to the actual storyline, though, because the story is is about them trying to get Capone, not necessarily about El, Al Capone himself. He's like the backstory. So th- they are kind of just giving you a backstory with him. He's really, like Justin actually pointed out, like it's it's all about the public eye with Capone. Yeah, but my, my, counter, at that my, point. my counter argument to that though is when Capone comes on the screen, there are times where De Palma goes out of his way to show us why people are afraid of him or why he's this mythical figure. If, if either commit to giving us some more of Capone or you can just completely write him out of the film and let him be a mythical figure and focus on the untouchables themselves, I, I feel but I like, feel like, yeah. like the Palma wanted to have his cake and eat it too. And it just doesn't work here for me. I feel like what makes it that way is because of the simple fact that De Niro was such a bankable name at that point, especially for gangster pictures that they knew they had something there as far as box office was concerned mm-hmm. and major audiences where they knew they could just run with it and it would work. And it definitely worked. I mean, the film was highly successful. Um, major audiences adored the film quick while we're talking about the film and nick included there because he's sitting there smoking his vape looking like he's as angry as possible <laughs> kevin costner <laughs> kevin, Co- kevin costner is elliot ness this is one of his biggest roles up until that point this is one of his biggest performances um no one wanted him for this role mind you and he got into this role by luck we'll start with you jd what did you think of kevin costner's elliot ness in the film and then we'll move on to nick I don't have a problem with any of the performances, honestly. I think Costner is fine. He's an engaging presence, and I find him compelling in this film. I mean, Sean Connery is the standout. I do think he deserved deserved the award that he got. Um, But, yeah, I mean, he's I I, I liked him, and I liked his chemistry with Connery. He was super good. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I know Nick loves uh, Costner for Robin Hood, Men of Thieves, the best, but... um, Oh, yeah. Sure. There you go. Because he doesn't have the ability to do a British accent. It's it's enjoyable. (laughs) man. Come on, where's Nick's anecdotes now? Come on, damn it. When I press him, he doesn't have anything. I mean, he's he's no hidden figures, Costner. (laughs) (laughs) No field of dreams. Yeah. Uh, no no draft dreams. day, Costner. I'm sure he loves Waterworld. <laughs> this was the first of his breakout roles. I mean, this was the film that kind of set him off, if I recall, to being a big box office name. The film was pretty big, not only in theaters, but on cable and on home video. Everyone really, really enjoyed this film, not only as a gangster picture, but as just, you know, basic entertainment for Oh yeah. yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, think, I think him, it serves him, that function well. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like he, him, and the character as the character was actually really compelling, as uh, you said earlier. But uh, and that he did a really good job. That it's just that him next to Sean Connery there in this film. I mean, I feel like he was the secondary character a lot of times in the scenes. Uh, but I mean, overall, he did a great job, and uh, he he was very deserving of like this kind of starting his career off. Yeah. So as as we're finishing this off, guys, it sounds as though there's a collective opinion here that Robert De Niro was not a good Al Capone. So I just want to hear your opinions before we finish up on this as to why you think he was or he wasn't a good Al Capone. And I then think, we will move on to... I just yeah, want to jump in go. on it. There he is. There. I think he was a fantastic Al Capone. I, and I get what you're saying. The film is called The Untouchables. It's more about Costner and the crew. I get it, but I like the scene with the baseball bat, and this is one of those things where I'm a huge Simpsons fan, so I get to watch things after the fact that I've seen parodied on The Simpsons a thousand times, so I never understood what that parody was about. But like the scene where he bashes the dude's head in with the baseball bat, and you get to see how menacing it. I just wanted more of his character. I thought that De Niro was fantastic in the role. I just wanted more of it. Just wanted more. I can definitely relate to that. I can relate to that so much. I watch. I started watching it earlier because I do own it, and uh, because we knew we were talking about this. By the way, Nick does like to throw things at me last minute, even though I should be planning better. But um, the simple fact is, is I knew we were going to be talking about it tonight, so I wanted to rewatch it again. 
as of today, before we talked about it tonight, because movies of that era, especially by Brian De Palma, who no longer makes movies. Um, and if you guys have not seen that documentary that's out right now called De Palma, I highly recommend it. He does touch on a lot of thoughts on how he made this movie and a lot of ideas behind this movie, among other movies he had done. Dress to Kill, Scarface, you name it, Mission Impossible 1. Um, check that documentary out. It's called De Palma. Um, but I just, I love this movie so much. I, I, I can't help it. It is a period piece in the 80s, and very rarely do period pieces in the 80s get it as well as De Palma did in this film. I mean, we're looking at that gif that I picked that's right in our live stream right now, and look at Costner and Connery yeah. right there. Look at that shot. Do we ever get shots that are that good anymore? I mean, it may be popcorn fluff to a lot, and I totally get that, but at the time, that's really what people went to the theaters to see. So oh. for me, that's why I love this film so much. It is fun. I mean, it's it's definitely, like I said, it's a movie I would recommend. It's no man next to your road, but it's good. It's fine. Oh, of course. Oh, not. Well, let me, hey, man. Hey, man. I don't think anyone's comparing anything <laughs> to man next to your road. On this I'm, I'm, I, I'm with Shane on that one. I'm with Shane on that one with the Mad Max. Video. Get out. I can't help it. Get out. Yes. Oh, yep. Yep. You have oh. to get out now, too. You're not. Oh. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I won't be as angry about that. I mean, the cool thing about this whole experience of doing the movie pod squad or any kind of podcasting together with other movie podcasts is getting differing opinions on, on everything. And that's the fun of it. If we all agreed on everything, how fun would it be to talk about the movies? It'd be no fun mm -hmm. at all. I love it. You love it. You know, the, the whole point is to try to like, get a opinion into it and see where we're coming from. And I love that personal experience so much. And that's why I'm glad we've had you guys on here for the untouchables review. And I'm glad I got to be a part of it. Definitely. Cause Nick lets yeah. me you know, be a part of such a small part of the epic film guys. podcast. <laughs> you get back over in your corner and keep quiet. <laughs> this small little, small half, not even 25 minute segment on the show. <laughs> you get back uh, over in your corner. You got, keep quiet. All, you were the Capone all in, in this good fun, uh, segment. All in good fun. You go <laughs> pet your goddamn hobster. All right, so yeah, that's going to be our uh, uh, spotlight reviews again for Sideways and the Untouchables. Um, yeah, I, I I did enjoy the Untouchables. I won't say I didn't enjoy it, and it definitely had its moments. It had some great parts about it that I loved. Uh, you know, some great spectacle to it. But I, I like I said, I think I wanted more out of it, and it's one of those things where. I've had this experience so many times where when you go back to a film that's this old that you're not experiencing in its time where it just doesn't have the same effect on you that it did if you experienced it in its time. So uh, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely say that about it because I know that there's many other films that are like that for me. 